Thank you. All right. These are my disclosures. <clears throat> and we are living in a uh, rather exciting era for systemic therapy. We have seen rapid advances, uh, particularly in the me uh, treatment of metastatic non-small cell lung cancer with uh, many new targetable genomic alterations, many new inhibitors for acquired resistance, uh, the development of multiple different uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, both FDA approved and coming down the pipeline, and more recent uh, technologies involving the use of adoptive cell transfer. <clears throat> but when I was asked to give this talk, I really paused and thought, what does a thoracic surgeon want to know about medical oncology? And I settled on three questions that I thought were uh, most relevant for the audience, namely, what agents are making an impact now? Which of these agents has potential for moving forward into the adjuvant setting? And lastly, what new agents are coming down the pipeline and where are we headed in the field? And so, uh, Thinking about agents that are making an impact now, I broadly have divided the talk up into targeted therapy and immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and when we think about targeted therapy, we're dealing with both uh, new agents for established targets that we're familiar with, like EGFR, ALK, ROS1, as well as many new targets that are rapidly emerging with effective inhibitors, uh, MET, TRAC, BRAF, RET, HER2, the list goes on and on. With respect to immune checkpoint inhibitors, we are watching the evolution of three strategies that I think are going to compete, uh, namely the use of PD-1 or PDL one inhibitors alone, uh, the use of PD-1 combined with CTLA-4 inhibitors, and the combination of a checkpoint inhibitor with chemotherapy. To start with targeted therapies in metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, we've seen the rapid evolution of targets and multiple, multiple agents, EGFR, ALK, ROS1, BRAF, MET, RET, HER2, TRAC, and as you can see, there are many inhibitors for each of these targets. To start with osimertinib, um, which is, I think, dominated the, the news rather recently, um, it was originally developed to be a T790M inhibitor, and in the Aura 3 study shown here, published by Tony Mock, uh, you can see that osimertinib in T790M mutant patients after progression on an initial EGFR TKI, osimertinib is clearly superior to the old standard of care, which was platinum-based chemotherapy. More recently, we've looked at whether the idea of taking osimertinib as a superior inhibitor and moving it into the front line, so not selecting patients that are T790M positive, but actually treating uh, uh, previously untreated EGFR mutant patients with osimertinib is superior to uh, standard first generation or second generation TKIs. So you can see here is the FLORA study, uh, which was published very recently by Jean-Charles Saria, and uh, when you look at progression-free survival on the left, you can see that osimertinib is clearly superior to a standard EGFR TKI, and when you look uh, on the right at overall survival, you can see that we're actually almost there with respect to osimertinib as well. Uh, as we discussed yesterday, this obviously complicates uh, how we think about acquired resistance when everyone is getting osimertinib up front, but what I think uh, we're actually seeing here and one of the strengths of osimertinib is not just that it is a less toxic and more potent inhibitor of EGFR, but actually that it is a more CNS penetrant inhibitor of EGFR. And when you look at the subset of patients that had CNS metastases at diagnosis, even though these patients were treated uh, with RT, uh, osimertinib remains uh, superior in this subgroup that is, has a particularly uh, poor prognosis at diagnosis. A similar strategy has been used for electinib, which is a third generation ALK inhibitor um, that previously was used for second line treatment uh, of patients with ALK alterations. And uh, the ALEX study uh, actually looked at moving electinib into the first line compared to crizotinib, which was the old standard of care. And again, you can see a much superior progression-free survival in these patients. Uh, the overall survival benefit is not there at present, but I suspect a lot of this is due to the fact that um, patients can cross over to crizotinib after electinib other second and third generation inhibitors, uh, given that we have many lines of inhibitors in ALK now, and that's probably part of why you, you're not seeing the overall survival benefit. And much like osimertinib, uh, 
Electinib is a much more CNS penetrant uh, ALK TKI. And as you can see here, when we look at uh, the actual incidence of progression in the CNS in patients treated with Electinib upfront versus Crizotinib upfront, the rate of CNS uh, progression is much higher with Crizotinib as opposed to Electinib. And elective, Electinib has now been approved by the FDA for frontline treatment of ALK. As I mentioned yesterday, we have an increasing number of ALK inhibitors for second and third line treatment, um, but the selection of each agent really hinges upon what type of acquired resistance mutation you're dealing with. Another uh, interesting uh, type of alteration that uh, has been discovered and treatments have been developed for over the past few years has been met exon 14. Uh, and what we, the met exon 14 alteration actually produces a longer lived version of the met protein. Uh, and uh, patients who possess these alterations can be treated fairly effectively with existing MET inhibitors like crizotinib and cabozantinib. Um, as you're probably noticing, some of these inhibitors work on multiple targets, and crizotinib is not only an ALK inhibitor, but also a MET inhibitor. And this was a series that was published by Paul Pack at uh, MSK, just showing that in patients that have these MET exon 14 alterations, um, they respond quite well to these inhibitors. Interestingly, these alterations also tend to occur more commonly in sarcomatoid lung cancer, and so definitely worth looking for in that uh, rare aggressive subset of patients. TRAC is another story that has emerged, uh, and there is now uh, early approval for uh, larotractinib in patients that have TRAC fusions. And these alterations occur uh, in many different solid tumors, um, but they do occur in lung cancer as well at a rate of about 1%. And as you can see from this data published by Alex Drillin, again at MSK, um, the, uh, when you look across tumor types at patients that have TRAC fusions, the response rate uh, to these agents is very high, uh, bordering on kind of 70%. And what's potentially more interesting is that when you look at progression-free survival, uh, you were getting out to uh, two or three years from initial treatment, and more than 50% of patients are still on treatment without progression, which is quite extraordinary, even for a targeted therapy. So to summarize some of these targeted therapy trends in metastatic lung cancer, we have new targets with effective inhibitors, we have old targets with more effective inhibitors, and we have newer inhibitors that are now moving to the front line, mainly because they're more potent, more CNS penetrant, and less toxic. But this begs the question, what about adjuvant treatment for patients with targetable genomic alterations? And so we, uh, I think, are all familiar with the ongoing Alchemist study, which is really aiming to uh, look at the utility of targeted therapy with either erlotinib, crizotinib, or immunotherapy in patients without EGFR ALK alterations following surgery. Uh, and I think the Alchemist study really came uh, out of the uh, failure of the Radiant study to answer the question of whether uh, EGFR kinase inhibitors um, actually improve survival after curative treatment. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think the, the, uh, the Radiant study failed beyond the fact that it just was not designed with EGFR mutations in mind. Um, when we think about osimertinib and electinib in the adjuvant setting, we're dealing with inhibitors that are more tolerable than first generation inhibitors. We're dealing with uh, inhibitors that we now know have superior clinical benefit in the metastatic setting uh, when compared head to head to the older inhibitors, crizotinib uh, and uh, erlotinib. And we're also dealing with inhibitors that are far more seen as penetrant. And I think this is probably the Achilles heel of the Alchemist study in that it is using inhibitors that do not get into the CNS as well. And when we look back at the Radian study, although I think everyone tends to ignore it because it, did, it was kind of initiated before we knew about EGFR mutations as a, a biomarker for response to EGFR kinase inhibitors. Um, but the interesting thing is in the subset of patients that did have EGFR mutations, the failure rate uh, in the CNS was actually much higher in the group that was treated with erlotinib, thus implying that one of the limitations of erlotinib in the adjuvant setting is inability to penetrate the CNS. And when we think back on kind of the history of chemotherapy um, and think back on leukemias and some of the earliest tumors that we were able to actually cure with chemotherapy, one of the biggest problems with curative treatment was that it did not get into the CNS. And I think we need to really return to first principles with respect to using CNS penetrant agents when we are thinking about adjuvant treatment uh, in the uh, solid tumor setting. 
And thus, I think that looking at these newer uh, targeted therapies in the adjuvant setting is going to be kind of the, the way of the future. And uh, the Adora study is already looking at osimertinib in the adjuvant setting for patients with EGFR mutations. Moving on to immune checkpoint inhibitors. We have seen a rapidly uh, evolving number of, EG, of sorry, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors for the treatment of lung cancer. PD-1 inhibitors, PDL1 inhibitors, and chemoimmunotherapy are all FDA-approved strategies for the treatment of metastatic lung cancer. And I suspect that we will probably see the approval of PD-1 and CTLA-4 combinations in the near future as well. The first approval uh, for PD-1 inhibitors came for uh, pembrolizumab and nivolumab a few years back now, based on uh, these two studies looking at patients that uh, had already progressed on platinum-based chemotherapy and randomizing patients to either a PD-1 inhibitor, uh, like pembrolizumab or nivolumab, or standard taxane-based chemotherapy, which was our old standard. And in both cases, pembrolizumab uh, and nivolumab were shown to be superior to our old standard. Pembrolizumab particularly showing superiority uh, to taxanes in patients that had greater than 50% PD-L1 expression. And I'll talk in a bit about what that means biologically. Um, and you can see the hazard ratios here are quite striking uh, at 0.5 uh, for pembrolizumab and 0.7 for nivolumab. And this was Really, really interesting given that our, our old hazard ratios for taxanes alone were quite awful. Subsequently, uh, we've looked at moving pembrolizumab and nivolumab into the first line, and the uh, Keynote 024 study, which you can see on the left, looked at pembrolizumab versus standard platinum based chemotherapy in PDL1 high expressors and demonstrated, again, superiority to standard frontline chemotherapy in patients that are high PDL1 expressors. So pembrolizumab has now been FDA approved for this indication and should be our standard frontline treatment for PDL1 high patients um, as opposed to. Uh, traditional platinum-based chemotherapy. At the same time, the Checkmate 026 study looked at uh, nivolumab in a similar setting, but with a different cut point, PDL1 greater than 5%. And these were different assays, different antibodies. Um, and this was the, the cut point that BMS thought was going to be appropriate for nivolumab. Shockingly, the study failed to meet its endpoint and did not show a survival benefit for nivolumab with a hazard ratio of close to one. Uh, in a subgroup analysis that was first reported by Solange Peters from Switzerland, um, when they looked at not PDL1 but tumor mutational burden in the study, they then found that nivolumab uh, had a benefit over chemotherapy. And this uh, biomarker of tumor mutational burden has been carried forward by BMS uh, in their newer studies of frontline uh, nivolumab plus ipilimumab. The strategy of combining chemotherapy with immunotherapy, I think, initially met a lot of skepticism amongst oncologists who said, well, you're just throwing the kitchen sink at patients. This doesn't make sense. You're going to get extra toxicity. You're not going to see survival benefit. But strangely, we did actually see improvement in PFS, um, although the overall survival data is still immature. Uh, and this has led to FDA approval for the combination of pembrolizumab with carboplatin and pemetrexed in the front line. As you're starting to see, we have different strategies evolving without comparison between them. And I think this has led to some confusion as to what the optimal frontline strategy is for the treatment of metastatic lung cancer. At the same time, BMS has also started looking at the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab in the front line. And uh, this really aims to give a patient two immune checkpoint inhibitors and really just uh, suppress any ability of the tumor to suppress an anti-tumor immune response. And uh, I think early on we thought maybe this strategy will rescue some of the PDL1 uh, mid or low range tumors. Uh, but in fact, when we look at response rates here, we see that uh, combination immunotherapy seems to really double down on the PDL1 high patients and really um, significantly increase their response rates. As you can see here, um, looking at the blue bars, in PDL1 high patients with greater than 50% expression, the response rate is kind of approaching uh, 80 and 90%, which are things we haven't really seen before. Uh, whereas uh, the response rate in uh, patients that are PDL1 low uh, doesn't really seem to differ between, uh, or at least not that much, between uh, single agent nivolumab and combination with ipilimumab. Um, this has been moved forward into a larger clinical trial, and although we don't have the results of it, it has been uh, initially reported as being uh, positive with respect to overall survival in the subset of patients that are tumor mutation 
organizational burden high. And I expect to see those results in the near future and potentially see uh, it move forward and receive approval from the FDA. Trying to uh, answer some of the questions around which of these strategies is superior, NCI Canada has moved forward uh, with the BR34 trial, trying to compare uh, combination immunotherapy with dravalumab and tremolimumab, so PDL1 plus CTLA4 inhibitor to chemotherapy plus single agent PDL1. Uh, and so data from this study should be coming forward soon, and it'll probably be one of the earliest ones to really give us a sense of which of these competing strategies is superior. So to summarize some of the trends that we're seeing in metastatic non-small cell lung cancer with respect to immunotherapy, uh, we're seeing frontline inhibitors uh, improve overall survival in specific patients, either PDL1 high or tumor mutational burden high, and uh, PD1 inhibitors move into the frontline for those indications. We're, we've seen chemoimmunotherapy improve PFS, um, again with a benefit driven primarily by PDL1 high patients, and that strategy has been approved for first line treatment now. And we're seeing the rapid emergence of PD1 CTLA4 inhibitor combinations, uh, which are reported uh, to improve overall survival in specific patient populations, although we're still waiting on the final data to know for sure. I want to pause for a moment and talk a bit about some of these biomarkers uh, because you've probably heard these terms thrown around a lot, PDL1 high, tumor mutational burden high, um, and I want to take a bit of time to talk about what that means. Uh, so PDL1 uh, is the protein target uh, that is expressed not just on tumor cells but on many immune cells uh, and really serves as a, a break on the immune system. Um, and we know that our PD1 and PDL1 inhibitors work better in patients whose tumors express PDL1 at a high level. Now, this is specific to lung cancer, and th this kind of association varies depending upon the tumor type you're dealing with. Um, the association is uh, less strong in melanoma that is just a far more immunogenic tumor overall. Uh, but as you can see here, more is more when it comes to PDL1 and response rates to PD1 inhibitors. Tumor mutational burden was investigated uh, a few years back, uh, and this is data published by um, Naya Rizvi at Columbia, uh, with the theory that the higher the number of mutations you have in a tumor, the more likely you are to have uh, neoantigens being produced, meaning uh, mutations in genes that produce altered proteins that can be expressed by MHC and recognized by a T cell. And looking at tumor mutational burden, uh, they, uh, Nair was able to show that in patients treated with pembrolizumab, if they had a high tumor mutational burden, they are much more likely to respond and have durable clinical benefit to pembrolizumab as opposed to those who were low expressors. Uh, and he was able to actually look at specific neoantigens in this paper in science and demonstrate that this response was uh, not just based on overall tumor mutational burden, but could actually be boiled down to functional T cell analysis, where we could identify which neoantigens uh, the immune system was able to go after in order to uh, eliminate tumor cells. Another interesting strategy that is not specific to, to lung cancer but does include lung cancer that kind of evolved out of this recognition of tumor mutational burden is looking at uh, patients that have deficient uh, mismatch repair resulting in a uh, MSI high status. It was first identified in colorectal cancer that MSI high patients uh, responded at very high rates to pembrolizumab, which was not uh, characteristic of colorectal cancer overall. Uh, and so a larger study was done looking at patients with any tumor that had uh, mismatch repair and MSI high status. Uh, and in this paper published by uh, Lee in Science, they actually were able to show that across tumor type, uh, irrespective of histology, if a patient had MSI high status, they responded to immunotherapy at very high rates. Uh, and not only did they respond at high rates, but uh, the overall survival was actually uh, almost unbelievable where you see that three years out with some of the most aggressive metastatic tumors you can imagine, uh, patients are still around uh, on pembrolizumab. And this resulted in FDA approval for pembrolizumab in patients that are MSI high, irrespective of histology or primary. What about immune checkpoint inhibitors in the adjuvant setting? Now, this is probably the, the most important and interesting slide uh, in the whole deck, and this, uh, these are the data from the Pacific study, which looked at patients with locally advanced lung cancer 
treated with chemoradiotherapy, and then randomized to receive either placebo or dervalumab, which is a PDL1 inhibitor. And as you can see here, the progression-free survival for these patients, for the patients that got dervalumab, was significantly higher than those that received placebo after standard treatment, with a hazard ratio of 0.5. This is the first time in a long time that we've seen not only something that adds to definitive uh, chemoradiotherapy, but results in such a staggering improvement in progression-free survival in patients with locally advanced disease. Um, this has led to FDA approval for Duvalumab, and I think also has uh, supported a lot of our interest in uh, the use of adjuvant immunotherapy in earlier stage patients. And so there are, there are more than a few studies that are ongoing in this setting. Adjuvants, uh, sorry, Alchemist is looking at nivolumab in the adjuvant setting, and NCI Canada is looking at BR31 uh, across um, resected tumor types, uh, randomizing patients to dervalumab versus placebo. Now, clearly uh, immunotherapy has a role in the adjuvant setting, but what about the future? What agents are coming down the pipeline? And you've probably seen variations of many of these agents pop up in clinical trials at your own institutions, uh, but I think we're in an era where we're seeing rapid proliferation of many, many different types of immunotherapy designed to be added on to standard PD-1 inhibitors. Uh, these consist of either additional checkpoint inhibitors uh, with targets like TIM3, LAG3, TIGIT, IDO, A2A re uh, receptor, um, and they all aim to uh, really further uh, remove the breaks on the immune system. Other strategies that are being looked at serve to uh, attempt to stimulate the immune system, uh, and most of these uh, targets are uh, immune agonists, so OX40, 41BB. Sting is particularly interesting and actually aims to co-opt some viral sensing mechanisms to uh, stimulate the immune system in the tumor microenvironment, uh, GITR. Uh, we've also seen the resurgence of cytokines uh, in the form of new cytokine fusion proteins uh, that seem to that uh, serve to again stimulate the immune system and try to produce an anti-tumor immune response. Um, we're also going to see more agents that try to kind of reform the tumor microenvironment, uh, some acting through the TGF beta pathway, and then I also think we're going to see. Uh, the resurgence of strategies that um, we may have lost interest in previously, but now might be promising in the setting of uh, combinations with immune checkpoint inhibitors, like vaccine-based strategies, uh, as well as epigenetic therapy. The ultimate aim, though, of all of these strategies really is to try to convert tumors that are cold to tumors that are hot. I'm going to talk about what that actually means. So. This is a relatively old paper now, um, but the, the group at Genentech, um, who kind of were very early, had a very early interest in immunotherapy, um, have in their experience kind of classified tumors, particularly lung cancer, into three different phenotypes. There are hot tumors or inflamed tumors, and those are tumors where you see good CD8 and CD4 T cell infiltration right into the tumor stroma. And these are tumors really that are probably primed uh, for the immune system to attack and eliminate tumor cells. Um, and these are the tumors in which PD-1 inhibitors really work, uh, where immune cells are there, they're ready to attack cancer cells, and they're only being held at bay by immune checkpoints. The next group are immune-excluded tumors, and those are tumors where you see CD8 and CD4 T cells, but they seem to be excluded from the tumor stroma. And this phenotype implies that the immune system can recognize the tumor, it just can't really get into it. There is something about the tumor stroma that is tolerogenic and is preventing these immune cells from getting in. Um, and there's more recent data that was published in Science uh, looking at uh, how this situation arises, and there seems to be a strong role for fibroblasts that express TGF-beta. And that's what I was talking about earlier, where um, some new strategies try to um, inhibit TGF-beta um, and allow these immune cells to try to get into uh, this tolerogenic tumor stroma. And then the last and most challenging situation is the immune desert phenomenon. These are the dead cold tumors where there are no immune cells hanging around. If there are, they tend to be suppressor cells, and uh, it seems the immune system just can't even recognize the tumor at all. And so I. Uh, Ira Melman has kind of advanced this model, um, which I'm a fan of, uh, that we really are dealing with three situations in drug development and immunotherapy. We're dealing with tumors that 
are dead cold, they're immune deserts, and you really need to look at strategies that can help the immune system recognize the tumor, uh, whether that is cytokine-based therapy, uh, vaccine-based therapy, or adoptive cell transfer. And you also have to look carefully at the tumor cells themselves and make sure that they haven't deleted part of the antigen uh, presentation system and thus made themselves uh, yes, uh, invisible to the immune system. In the uh, excluded phenomenon, uh, there are different strategies to try to reform the tumor stroma in a way that is more immunogenic. And then in patients that have hot tumors where the immune system can already recognize the tumor but perhaps uh, has uh, suffered from immune exhaustion or other uh, phenomenon mediated by immune checkpoints or other characteristics of the tumor, um, there are very specific strategies around checkpoints and immune agonists that can be utilized. And I think it's also important to keep in mind that uh, with all of these steps that are involved in uh, an ant generating an anti-tumor immune response, um, there not only are multiple uh, potential uh, agents and factors at work, both in the patient, in the tumor, and in terms of uh, what we uh, do to the tumor with uh, respect to treatment, but there are also multiple stages uh, of the development of an immune-related response. And uh, a one-size-fits-all approach or uh, an approach that doesn't take into account the complexity of an individual patient's immune system, I think, uh, won't give us the ability uh, to uh, bring the benefits of immunotherapy to, to all patients. And so I think moving forward, uh, we're all going to have to become an immunologist to a certain degree in order to help develop these treatments and advance them. So lastly, uh, in my remaining time, I want to talk a bit about where all of this is headed. Um, so we talked a bit about the agents that are coming down the pipeline, but when I think forward five, 10 years, I think that the, the real future of immunotherapy in lung cancer is gonna lie in these two strategies. So either adoptive cell transfer or the use of bispecifics, um, specifically bispecific T cell engagers. And uh, adoptive cell transfer involves either uh, ex vivo modification of TILs, um, plus or minus the creation of CAR T cells, and bispecific T cell engagers are actually a really unique antibody design that uh, essentially tries to bring an immune cell um, with one sp a specific immune cell antigen um, targeted by one arm of an antibody together with a cancer cell with the other arm of the antibody uh, attaching to a tumor antigen. I won't talk a lot about those, but they are uh, coming uh, down the pipeline in the very near future. And with both of these strategies, I think what's unique about them and what gives them an added advantage that goes beyond uh, our checkpoint inhibitors and our other immune agonists is that they, for the first time, give us the ability to really target specific antigens on the tumor and generate a very uh, specific and targeted and robust anti-tumor immune response. So we're not depending upon a pre-existing um, anti-tumor immune response that we rev up with a checkpoint inhibitor, but we are actually creating the anti-tumor immune response with these cells or with these bispecifics. And then we can add other things on top of them. Um, now, there are challenges with this strategy, so the power of this strategy is also paired with toxicity, which can be challenging, and the risk of cytokine release syndrome or other toxicities like uh, encephalopathies are significant, and so you don't want um, people without experience developing or giving these treatments. Uh, the infrastructure for creating these treatments is complex, especially with respect to the CAR T cells. You really do need a medical grade cell factory in order to produce these treatments. And uh, creating treatments that produce immune memory is key and also challenging. So when we talk about adoptive cell transfer, the uh, idea here, and this is um, a strategy that's been in evolution over several years is you take TILs, so tumor infiltrating uh, lymphocytes from a patient's tumor, uh, you take them out of uh, the tumor and you expand them uh, ex vivo. And the idea there is that within the tumor, there are probably CD4 and CD8 T cells that can recognize the tumor, but they have an immune exhaustion phenotype, but perhaps not a terminally exhausted phenotype. Um, you then, uh, after you expand these ex vivo, you then reinfuse them with IL-2 or a similar uh, immunostimulatory product following lymphodepletion uh, with the idea that you can kind of reset the immune system and generate an anti-tumor immune response. Um, and at Princess Margaret, we've put a lot of effort into developing a medical grade cell therapy program uh, in a factory that can actually produce these cells. Uh, and we've actually
started to develop our own novel CAR T cell designs uh, in house, which I think will be particularly interesting going forward. And you might ask, what in God's name is a CAR T cell? I keep hearing about these and I have no idea what they are. So uh, CAR T cells are a very interesting design. Uh, and what they uh, grew out of was the uh, recognition that we could generate all these antibodies that can recognize tumor antigens, but the antibodies themselves might not actually be that useful. So how do we take our ability to make antibodies against tumor antigens and actually turn that into a vehicle that can kill tumors? And uh, what was done in the CAR T cell design, and we've gone through a few iterations of this, we're now on fourth generation um, CAR T cells, which are called trucks. Um, and we have armored cars, and the, the acronym is going to get more and more insane. Um, but the, I, the central idea is that you take the part of an antibody that can recognize an antigen, you glue that onto uh, the, the gene for a T cell receptor um, with a, a novel uh, cytoplasmic domain that contains a lot of co-stimulatory factors in it. So you essentially are creating a T cell receptor that can recognize what you want it to recognize uh, and it stimulates itself. Um, and then you take someone's uh, own uh, T cells, you uh, ex vivo kind of insert the gene for this receptor, and voila, you have uh, a ton of T cells that recognize exactly what you want them to recognize. Um, and we've, all, we've now seen the first FDA approval for CAR T cells in uh, leukemia and lymphoma. And we're rapidly seeing the proliferation of this technology and trials in this area in solid tumors, uh, particularly in GBM, but you're going to see this roll out in many different solid tumors in the very near future. And thus, to summarize uh, the entire talk, uh, we're seeing rapid advances in targeted therapy with new targets, new agents, new frontline drugs, and new adjuvant potential. And we're also seeing transformative advances in immunotherapy with multiple frontline IO strategies emerging, although comparison is needed between them, uh, locally advanced IO strategy, which is now FDA approved, and novel agents and cell-based therapy emerging rapidly. And these are the strategies that I really do think are the future and uh, will become the mainstay of our treatment for metastatic cancer uh, over the course of the next five to 10 years. Again, I'd like to thank all my collaborators and uh, that's all, thank you.